We got turkey tail. Last week we did lion's mane before the chat. Get the hemispheres balanced before we talk on the chat. Man, that feels good. Yeah. Want a little swing, Chris? Yes, I will. 32 is unforgiven. <laughs> it totally is. Don't whip it in the mirror. Oh, straight overhead. No warm up. Oh, one hand on that. It's yeah, I know. It's, that's what I mean. You have to really fucking grip that <laughs> thing, otherwise it's going through the mirror. Through the mirror, man. That 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 is gonna be a route. Nice. <laughs> oh, oh, good. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> nice, mate. <laughs> it's a good bit of steel, that, isn't it? Good to, go. good to go. We're good to go. Hello. Once again, episode three, the Rediscover Human tribe is back with Chris and Josh. And today's episode, we want to do something um, a bit more specific. On, uh, once again, I guess we did a specific one last week. This week, I wanted to do it as it's the, the guys have kindly let me sort of lead this one. And I wanted to make it on a tool that is helped me very much in the last, since discovering it six months ago, um, biomechanically, physically, mentally, in, in many ways. Um, but we'll get into all that. But basically, I want to do an episode on the rope, which some of you might have seen me playing with. Um, so I just wanted to let the guys, if they have any questions, it might help any of you guys listening might have questions. So I wanted Josh and Chris to ask me any questions they've had, and I'll tell the story of how I, I got into it and that. But yeah, um, thanks for letting me do this, guys. Appreciate it. It's cool, man. Mm, yeah. I think a good place to start would be just giving everyone a little bit of background on your sort of like athletic career. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if someone was just coming in, well, I've been training with you over the last few months mm. and I know how revolutionary the rope has been for you. Mm. I think if it was just anyone coming in off the street, you know, they could find a kettlebell or whatever piece of equipment, mm. revolutionary. Yeah. But you with your background, the fact that you've sort of played with all these training tools over years and years and years, and then you discover the rope and it really changes the game for you. I think that's an important thing to highlight. Yeah. I, I, I guess I covered some of it in the first one, but I will, I'll briefly cover it again, I guess. So I did a, um, I was, I did breakdancing as a young, I was a young person. I was always fascinated with movement and what the body can do um, with just, without, many variables like I liked skateboarding skateboarding I did rollerblading and things like that but just the human body take away all the variables that we've sort of created the body in space against gravity or whatever breakdancing was fascinating to me um, then I got into parkour and free running I uh, went on to win world free running championships and some Red Bull art of motions uh, then I competed in Ninja Warrior and competed in American Ninja Warrior I was captain of team, uh, team Europe and we won the first season of USA versus the world Went on to the, when UK finally got a Ninja Warrior, I've uh, come last man standing on two out of the three series that I've competed on that. So it means I got the furthest on the show, yet to complete it, if I'm honest. And we'll see what the future holds. Um, but, I, but essentially, I did the best at, at Ninja Warrior. And it's funny because even though I've achieved that much, I, I know my body. And the more you know about movement <clears throat> and biomechanics and the more you learn about that and you see athletes that are impressive and then the more you improve your ability to move then you can go you can see things in athletes because you know them in yourself and this is this is true as you improve in any sport if you're a martial if martial artist you've gone through that path or in football or something like that you're able to see the skill in what someone's doing because you have your own practice if you don't have your own practice it's really hard to identify this stuff. i'm sure you see it with rugby yeah 100%. you must see it with kettlebells when we're swinging it you must see the little 
the ti- little mini timing cues yeah, at the back. The, all, the, all the minute finesse, and like yeah, you can you can see it not just yeah. in kettlebells, but everything. Man. In everything, yeah, but yeah, I'm yeah. saying we, we, we each have a practice that we do that helps us to see it that they can relate to other things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, my baseline has been human movement, not like I say, it's not BMXing or anything like that. It's just humans expressing themselves physically, like breakdancing, free running. Um, Dance, it dances, I guess breakdancing covers that, but dance as well. And so doing it somewhat mindlessly or unconsciously to a degree, although it's harsh to say that on myself, but it was like when I trained breakdancing, I just saw cool tricks, flips, strong holds, hollow backs, and knew nothing about levering, leveraging within the body, how strength should be. And whereas you look at a gymnast, and if you silhouette at a gymnast, they would all look pretty much identical in a silhouette because they are having to have the epitome of like strength in order to hold iron cross, they all have to have aligned strength and use the body in the same way because it takes such strength to do it. Mm-hmm. Whereas you see a breakdancer, you silhouette a breakdancer, they all look slightly different because they're not following the most, they don't have to be, because it's about style as well, they don't have to be the most optimum use of strength. And we talk about this with strong men as well. St- strong men, in order to lift the heaviest weights, generally will have similar techniques in everything that they're doing. And there's a, there's a, there's a path to those techniques. And so on this journey of trying to, of, of growing an understanding of movement, having no understanding of movement, just wanting to copy people like, like I'd see a junior breakdancer who could do press ups on his fingertips with his feet hovering off the floor. And I'd want to copy that. And so I'd try and do it in my own way, but I had no understanding of like a gymnastics way to build the strength where your elbows should be positioned or anything. So you just, throwing pain at a wall basically. But as I've grown and th- truthfully through injuries and through problems that have caused me to ask certain questions led me onto a path of biomechanics. And so getting into running was a, a massive chapter for me. I guess I didn't touch on that. I got into um, obstacle course racing because I thought if I can, I can do the obstacles, if I run well, then I could do well at obstacle course racing. And it's another challenge for me. And I liked being in nature a bit more at that point. So did that, got it, that made me get into running. And after a few years of running, I got injuries and these niggles that wouldn't go away. I could warm up through them, but then they, they would feel worse. Once I cooled down, my body would just feel really bad. And so I, I got to a point where I was like, I don't want to just keep warming up through niggles. How about I try and solve the niggles and work on that? And there's so many things to address when it comes to that. But fundamentally, if you're if you're driving a car and the axle's bent or the disc pad's at a wrong angle, it's going to affect the way the car drives and it's going to wear out a lot quicker. And that's how I see a human is we all have the same skeletal frame and the set, there's obviously small nuances, but we've got the same frame, same amount of ligaments and joints that, that are supposed to function the same way. <clears throat> the same way all cats have similar similar biomechanics to each other and, and birds and other animals. If, if I can't run without being injured, then something is wrong at a fundamental level with my biomechanics and how my body is functioning. Now to identify... The problem is a real minefield because where hurt, the, the place that hurts is not where the issue normally is. 95, 97, 99% of the time, what hurts, and Strongfit said this, and I've been saying, he just coined it in a really nice way. He said, that's the end of the issue. It's not the start of the issue. So often we have injuries where the muscles or the tendons are getting stretched. So there's a tightness somewhere else that you don't feel pain in that's causing the stretch to happen. So where we feel pain, we go to that and we pressure that and we ice that. But the root of it is some tight part of our body somewhere that could have been caused from an injury in childhood, from from previous sports. Um, It could be caused from uh, emotional trauma that's locked us into a certain way of posture that we hold our body. Um, So there's many causes. So like I say, to get to the root of this, to solve or to, to improve the biomechanics back to good posture and in turn, good walking and good running patterns, is it is a, it is a minefield that in, that you have to face not you can't just go to a physiotherapist one i think they're they're not on the money anyway because they're just looking at where the pain is but you have to look at it physically so you do have to solve it physically whether you use a phys- phys- physiotherapist or other practices to do that which are out there on like certain people are coming up with good solutions but you have to work on the emotional side of yourself because there's something emotionally that's holding the injury there as well and that might be some um, self-worth issue or something that i don't deserve this ability to do this anymore or something like some real deep issue, some trauma that's come from somewhere. Um, And that's when you have to get into sort of plant medicines and um, breath work and 
uh, what stuff Chris Walton does, EFT, the tapping. There's so much. So the, the journey is of, of correcting biomechanics is a long one. But for me, it's if the fundamental purpose of our body is to transport our mind. And it's designed to do that by walking and running. That is its primary design, like a car is meant to drive. Now, the car can also light up a room if you turn the headlights on, or it can have air conditioning, or it can play music. But the purpose of it is transportation. The purpose of it is to drive from A to B, and the other stuff is all secondary. So the purpose of our physical flesh body is transportation in the mode of walking and running. And so from that spawns everything else, throwing patterns, swimming, and stuff like that are all forms of... of functional patterns of movement that come off from locomotion that might be reverse patterns of locomotion to, to throw is like a we use what's running one way we reverse it to throw um and maybe with visuals you might be able to understand that more or you can just grasp it um so on that journey of, of getting into biomechanics and trying to solve my ability so that i could run regularly without injuries and um and that was that was it. I, I just loved running. I love spending time in nature. I love looking up at mountains, looking at the summit of Snowdon, and going, "I can be up there in an hour," or or an hour later, I'm suddenly on top of it and running down the other side, gleefully, you know. And it's and the mountain shrinks. The the more you're able to run and and be healthy in your body in the in the the purpose of transport that it's made for, the the more confident you feel in your surroundings and the more at home you feel on Earth. In a way, if you're trying to walk up a mountain and you're ankle sore and you're sweating and you're breathing heavy there's not much joy in that and so some people just then i'm just not going to walk up mountains <laughs> so then i'm just going to sit in a house all day or i'm going to walk on flat ground my whole life well that's fine that's your choice but for me it's I, I like the empowering feeling that it gives me to be able to conquer a mountain as light as possible and, and as free as possible so that is what's driven me to understand my body on top of that i'm able to then help others because of my quest um which is which is a real benefit as well um and that has led me to one of the first things on that chapter of someone i saw asking all the right questions that i started to ask at that point was naudi aguilar of functional patterns he was asking a lot of questions about weightlifting, yoga and stuff like this now i pursued that path as far as i could as far as i was allowed i did the human foundations course um i did the online course listened to a lot of stuff he said um, and came to an, a dead end with it, if I'm honest. I came to a dead end and that's that's a whole story for another time. But that dead end, well, I'm grateful for that journey and that's led me onto another ladder because someone says, have you seen this guy, David Weck? He invented the BOSU ball, that half dome inflatable ball that people balance on in the gym. Um, I was like, no, I've never heard of this guy. And this is uh, Arthur Pollins put me onto this, a breathwork guy. I was at a workshop with uh, Tony Riddle the natural lifestylist and brought this up and he mentioned this to me and said no I'll check him out and so that night I was sleeping in my car in Chester before I was going to run 10 miles the next day with Tony Riddle and I went on my phone and I, I searched for this guy on Instagram I was ended up on like a three-hour binge till about 1 a.m in my in the back of my car staring at my screen not a good idea but it was one of those days when you're just really caught in a passion of something like I, I was watching these Instagram videos and I just couldn't quite understand him but there was something that clicked for me that was like keep watching, keep watching, because there'd be these little nuggets that made sense to me, talking about you've got to put martial intent into your movement and stuff. And I went on the website and I saw, oh, these guys are legit. They've got, they do courses. Like, he looks like a crazy dude. Like, he's wearing two or three pairs of glasses at a time. Um, but then he's got people around him that seem like legit athletes. They do monthly uh, courses. They do running workshops. They sell products. It must be legit. And so I was going to spend some money on my next f functional patterns course and on uh the reason i'm in bristol was there was a coach here that was really good on him as well and when that fell through i thought just trust this just trust this let's follow this through and so october last year i ended up going out to san diego um to do my WEC method qualification and i hadn't touched a rope at this point i'd just seen it online and i'd seen the pulses they do when they run and they have like maracas like beads in these hand things they hold in the hand and, and every time you run you bounce the beads and it teaches you the rhythm of to pulse with your hands as you run. And I thought that looks really interesting. I am into running. If there's if there's someone claiming that the biomechanics of running can be done slightly different, I'm gonna listen. I'm not gonna just just believe off the bat, but I'm gonna listen to because it's it's a fascinating topic for me. If someone's claiming that maybe we don't all run how we're 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 told we should run and when you look at sprinters on TV and they're they're 
square and they keep their spine stiff and they swing their arms. And this guy's saying that that's wrong. And you look at Bolt and the way you say Bolt runs and he's swinging all over the place, but that might be the reason he's faster. You're like, well, oh, the, the point proves itself that he is faster than the other. So maybe there's something in it if this guy can tell me how. So anyway, I went over to, to there, to San Diego, did the course and within the first day, we, we it was a three-day course and every day you did a bit on the ropes, a bit on the pulses and a bit on Royal Coil and so, and a few other things, which I can't really explain on, on a podcast. But within, I think, a minute of picking up the rope for the first time and them explaining that it connects the right hand and the left hand like when you have a, a cup and a string and you talk to someone down the cup and the string and that's your right hand and your left hand are talking to each other. When that clicked... <laughs> I was like, whoa, I've got to put time in on this. And so I was there with the guy called Ken, Ken Diesel. And he was from Florida, big black sprinter guy. And we ended up just getting on like a house on fire. And we went out and, you know, certain herbs are legal in California. So we went and got some herbs that evening. And I went to his uh, Airbnb and, and he showed me some more on the, I did half an hour in class or whatever on the rope. And then he showed me some more and he'd been doing it for about six weeks, a month to six weeks at that point. And he was really like looking fast with it, but I didn't really know what I was looking at. He just looked strong and powerful with it. And he said, he said, Tim, I've done about 40 hours in the last month on this rope. My 100 meter time's gone down. I can't remember how much he said it's gone down. Or he said, he's running as fast now as he ever did in high school. And he's like not trained for it. He's just doing rope and pulses. And he's like, you just got to put the time in. And I was like, okay, got it. And so next day I went to class, putting time in on the rope. In between learning things, I was on the rope. In the evenings with him, I was on the rope. <clears throat> Came back to England. I was there for a few weeks. I'll go, just skim on that. And I spent more time with David Weck. And I, I stayed for 10 days after the course finished. And I stayed at his house. And we went to Joshua Tree together as well. And I got to ask him all the questions I could. I got to see him move. I got to go truly to understand it as well as it could be explained by the man that sort of brought this. I don't even know how he brought it through. I'm, I'm assuming he discovered it somehow. I don't know if someone taught him. I don't Probably know. some crazy stories so, to that. Yeah, I'd love to get him on at some point and chat to him about it. Um, but anyway, essentially, I put the time on the rope. I came back to England. I was in the gym every day. I managed to hit, I think, about 40 hours in a month, maybe... A, 40 hours and 40 days or something like that but there was times when I'd go and I'd just go I'm going to do five minute warm up on the rope an hour later I'm just sweating swinging this rope um and it's and it's I, I don't know got, you got any questions up to this point so we so my personal experience with it is you know I've only played around a bit with it a little bit mm -hmm. stuff you've shown me and immediately I felt there was a difference yeah. and like I said before I played Quite in, a lot. in what way was that difference carried over to you the way you moved or to yeah definitely so i think through years of playing rugby and also through like squatting and doing conventional barbell movements i'm pretty rigid my upper body mm -hmm. and there's a fluidity that you need to adopt or the rope teaches you to adopt and it hasn't fully clicked for me yet but i know there's something there and i've got a feeling first of all, it's really enjoyable to do. So I want to do it anyway, but I just have got a sense that once that starts clicking and I'm able to come become really fluid on the rope, then that fluidity is going to transfer over into other movements, other practices that I'm doing. Yeah. Um, it's that 40 hours, I think. Yeah, that's the, that's the mark. I think that's think. it. I'm going to take that. As Ken told me, I'm going to say that to you because you've probably done an hour, an hour and a half, maybe two yeah. so far, but it's you get your own rope and you just put in the time. And it's, it's almost a meditation sometimes, isn't it? You get lost in the flow. The rope does half the work. But I'm not sure if, if we're missing. So is there anything there? Missing just leading up to this point? Um, Not particularly, dude. Yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm, yeah, I'm just interested in just listening to your cool. story, man. Okay. I'm just observing over here. Cool. I'll, I'll carry on then. So I put in the time on the rope. I, And then, like, we went out for a run the other day. And I was saying, when you move, when you run you imagine the underhand rope. So what, what the rope does, and it's, it's hard without the visuals, I guess. Um, you know what, this might be a good time to go to the video and we'll go to that. So as of today or around today, when this podcast gets released, I'm releasing a video on YouTube, which is uh, me explaining the rope with the visuals. Because I think the visuals really, really help as well. Um, 
so I'm going to show it to these guys. They've got a draft done, not completely finished. And then if you guys can go away and watch it or you can watch it after this or something, but we're going to cut here. I'm going to show these guys and we're going to come back and, and just get some reactions. Cool. So uh, we've just watched the video that you're releasing today. Where when the, the same day this podcast is coming out. It should be in, to be determined within this week though. Okay, cool. Keep an eye out. Uh, but for everyone else that's listening who wasn't able to pause this and go watch the video, do you want to just explain a little bit about the rope, why it's, you know, more special than your average rope? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, I guess part of the reason I'm doing this is because I'm launching to sell my own ropes today. And I'm not doing this because I'm on some hustle, I see an opportunity. It's because I'm really passionate about it. Because I, and I think anyone that's listening at this point gets that right i can vouch um, for that yeah and the difference with this rope because someone's like can i use a skipping rope and you you can use a skipping rope and you'd still it would still be the same patterns of movement but you wouldn't get the feedback that the weight of the rope is sort of as you swing the rope it's kind of pulling you and guiding you and you do these subtle movements that you notice as you get more attuned with the rope come from kind of the ground up from your feet and kind of from your center you know if you see like a, a golf swing or a boxer doing uppercut and it comes from their feet first and it ripples up through the body. The weight of the rope helps you to find that. What what it, because someone, people say it's kind of like poi or it's kind of like bow staff. Or a lot of people message me and say it's like this sport or it's like that. I could see it, wrestling patterns in it and stuff. I'm like, I don't even do wrestling. I, I, I don't, so I can't see that. But from you coming from a wrestling background, that's cool to hear that you see that in it. So what it does, what it really does is it trains in a in a category of movement that no other sp sport can really hit because it's coordination training people train strength and they'll train the sport but they don't train the whole body to work as one unit because we don't really know how well this is the only tool i've found because it connects your left and your right side it completes the circuitry of your left and the right of energy going out from the right the left is involved as well and when energy goes out the left the right is involved as well so it, it that that can that light connection that isn't stiff like with a bow staff the movements will be the same but if you've got any kind of mobility issues in your shoulder or your wrist it's going to limit it because the rope's forgiving enough it allows you to have bad mobility but still work through it while you smooth the edges of that mobility and, and improve the mobility and learn the patterns that you should be moving in if we, we talk about mention strong fit and that he talks about internal and external torque well when you're swinging the rope if you if you imagine holding a if you imagine holding a sword right now and you're swinging it in an uppercut motion, left and right and left and right. If you just play fight with a sword, that's the underhand motion, and you can picture how you're drawing a figure of eight with your hands at that point. And when you're moving on this figure of eight path, all of your joints should, for it to be the most efficient, they would all be involved. Now, often it wouldn't. We just move our wrists or we just move our shoulders and our ribs or our spine wouldn't move. But as you do that pattern over and over at hundreds of thousands of times, eventually your ribs and your spine learn to get involved in that pattern. And so it spreads the movement over more joints. And when you spread the movement evenly over more joints, then you're able to move with a lot more ease rather than the pattern. And I think that was my sort of exact experience with it. So the first time I was swinging it, I was rigid as a board and the rope just coming down either side. Yeah. But then you you learn to start moving with the rope and just like you said your spine almost wakes up and you start getting into this sort of flow and almost flow state as you're doing it yeah. and like you mentioned in the video it's almost like a standing meditation yeah. uh and you can see how that can be so applicable to many many other sports or probably every other sport because just building that coordination between your left and your right side mm -hmm. and enhancing that is just gonna great in your ability to compete at whatever you want to compete at exactly it's it, it's so we talk about the rope you've got a piece in the uh, handle in the left and one in the right and you've got the rope complete in the circuit but it's, it's also which is how it applies to other sports weightlifting or anything is as you're swinging the rope it hits the ground or it should be set to a length where it hits the ground every rotation and when it does that your ear hears when it hits the ground and what happens after it hits the ground is it starts to rise so your ear knows when it's hit the ground so it knows that it's starting to rise so your legs know to start to spring so you're getting this feedback of the hands being at the and this is where it differs from jumping the rope and and i hope people can can grasp this because this is it's, it's it's people think it's similar and yet it's the complete opposite of jumping the rope when you jump a rope 
your hands go down as your feet come up. So you're compressing and you learn to like hover in space. What you want to do when you jump is you want your the kind of knees and hands or feet to be at the lowest point and then they all rise together. If you think about springing up, you want to extend everything evenly at the right time. So you crouch and then you jump. So you push with your legs and your arms rise. So you know when people dunk, they swing their arms behind, they plant their feet and then they, as their body starts to, legs start to extend, their arms come up. When you're swinging the rope, it hits the floor at the lowest point and then everything rises from that point. So you're getting this audio feedback that connects your lower body and your upper body to work together. And the rope connects the left and the right. So it's, it's, it kind of completes all circuitries for the body in that sense. So you can start to play with it. And you'll see in the video, I'm playing with jumping side to side and, and footwork, the footwork that comes along with it as well and head over foot placement. There's things that... Um, when I was playing with the rope, I'd want to ask one of the wet coaches and like, I've got this question and this question. And I didn't end up really asking any questions. I just put time in and I didn't need the answers. My body just found the patterns by themselves. It's, it really just came to me and it just, and I think it can come to anyone because it's in our DNA is in, in the way we move. So it's just, he, the thing with WEC is he talks so passionately, like that this is one of the most interesting things. He talks like we, we're living in like, where the roots of humans before guns, right? Where you had to, people would just sneak up on someone and slit them with the, with a like a thing under their armpit and kill them right there. And it's like you had to be so much sneakier and you had to be in balance. And you had to, it's, he, he talks like about biblical times and stuff like this and how humans, we're, we live so differently now to how we used to because you can just have a gun and you live in a house with locks and stuff like that. But back in the day, you had to be so much more on point with your body and knowing how to move and be ready at all times. And he comes from that perspective and he talks about sticks, stones and the rope. And he talks about David and Goliath. You know, that's how David beat Goliath because he had a, the rope and the ability to use it, right? And slinged the, the rock because he knew how to. So I've noticed this as well since starting to use it. It's just like that concept of being always ready to go. So when you see an animal in nature and they're, you know, just walking along and uh, in a split second they can spring off or they can, uh, you know, they can leap, pounce to attack. Mm. And I think for me, when I was doing more, before coming into this late, latest training block where I was doing more barbell training, like I said, I was, I was stiff, I was rigid. Mm. And if you said, oh, you know, let's start training, I'd always have to warm up. Whereas now since starting to use the rope and just employing more like functional fitness training i feel like that idea of uh supple leopard you know just ready to go at any time yeah, exactly. yeah. and i think the the rope is a great tool for that uh in terms of having you ready all the time and then it's great as well to replace a warm-up in your training you can add it into everything it yeah. can be the warm-up it can be the cool down it can be the workout itself if you have the heavier rope that i've got it's a full-on workout um and it's it's just it is not someone it wouldn't benefit. You don't have to warm up to do it. Like how many how many things like kettlebells? We're playing with the thirty two earlier, and it's like fair play. You just jump straight in. The kettlebells are one of the best things actually. That you, you, it seems like you can just jump in on it, right? And yeah, warm, pretty much. But, but heavy weights at the gym, like you got to warm your lower back up and everything. Sports before you get intense, you you got to warm up. But it's a rope. You don't have to do any warm up. You can pick it up for one minute if you want. Like dinner's cooking. I'm just going to step out in the sunshine, on the grass, barefoot. You can take it anywhere with you. You can do it while chatting to friends. You can do some plant medicines and do it. And it's like... And I don't think you you finish training with the rope and you don't feel like you've smashed yourself at the gym. So I like to use it on alternate days. So say I'm training mm. and next day I'll do maybe a mobility and more of a rest day mm. and you can jump on the rope and then you'll still feel, you'll feel even fresher for doing that Every the next time. day to go back to training. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So to go into the figure of eight pattern, to try and explain that a little more, if you picture um, a, an American sprinter and their square back and their shoulders stay level and their arms swing forwards and backwards, they'll swing their arm up, they'll hit the end point and then they'll swing their arm back and they'll hit the end point and swing their arm up. Now, you've got your, in your movement pattern then, and this isn't to say they're not incredible athletes, by the way, which they obviously are. There's that, you're, you're, you're swinging a body part hitting an end and then swinging it back and hitting an end. Now you pitch, if you can just round the corners of that each end and turn it into a figure of eight, you're never having to stop moving because you're just 
curving around the edge of the path and coming back on yourself. And then, so it turns these dead end movements into smooth, never ending movements because you've just turned an out and back into a figure of eight. If, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And and so you teach yourself that using the rope. Using the rope, it starts with the wrists, you notice it, but then the shoulders get it, the ribs get it and the spine. And then when you start to run, you start to realize I can run and I'm not just like mindlessly plodding or swinging. There's never end to my motion and it comes from the feet up and it's, and it's these spiral patterns of internal and external torque through the muscles. So you're constantly almost in a flow while you're exercising. And then you, because of that, you're more efficient. Exactly, yeah. It's the way, and if you look at your forearm, the muscle that wraps around your forearm, it doesn't just go from your elbow to your wrist. It wraps around it. Like if you're trying to empty, if you're trying to um, wring water out of a towel, you don't just pull the towel at both ends and pull it straight. You twist it around itself, right? To wring it out, to, to get the maximum tension into that thing and it's the way our, the way our muscles wrap around our bones to work is they want they work better with a bit of rotational intent in them and you know that when people bench press and they say try and bend the bar right because yeah. you're putting a rotational intent into it and what that does is maximizes the muscles as they wrap around the bone to take the slack out whereas if you think about bench pressing linearly you're there's slack in your muscles you want to take it all out with this rotational intent and that's in the rope as well. It's, it doesn't, the rope, that's kind of a, a separate thing, but that's, it's all in the rope. Well, the rope, what the rope does it, once you get proficient at it, it kind of entrains you to go from that internal to external talk. You become used to going in and out of that. Exactly. And then because of that, you become more efficient, more powerful, more explosive, all of these things. All of it, it's all crossover. And it's just putting those neuro pathways down of like creating patterns of movement in the body that I don't know whether we ever had it as children and grew out of it or we never had it because we never saw other people moving that way do you know what i mean because we moved the way our parents moved kind of thing and because no one th this is the the groundbreaking potential of this thing is like people never really other than like you see tribesmen you see there's a, there's another company called gota greatest of all time athletes and they they are on very some they they each have differing views on some things but very similar train of thought with a lot of things and they've analyzed all the greatest athletes of all time the ones that were the, were the greatest of all time. I never had, had injuries in like over 10 years and stuff like that. And they all moved with these patterns of rotational intent with them, these spiral patterns on the fourth um, metatarsal of the foot uh, with the heels driving away. And I think as we get into strong fit more, he'll be talking about this. The heels drive away, not in. We get this, most of us, our, our heels sort of come in this duck footed way. And it's, it's, it, to, to most people that don't care or whatever, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But it's like once you get into it, it's hard not to think if if you can improve your biomechanics, everything you do, not just sport, but life is going to just be more relaxed. And you're going to have better longevity. You know, your your the tires are going to wear out a lot slower because you're doing things in, in alignment with the way that we're designed. Um, and so there's a it's kind of like a, it's an exciting time because I feel like because of the power of the internet, there's all these different people trying to come up with the answers. Like I say, functional patterns, you've got WEC method, you've got GOTA, you've got strong fit, all circling like solutions to help humans physically in a massive way for those who are ready, that have done the work on themselves, that have earned it in a way, the right to be to be to to have come across this stuff on the internet. Because some people, they find something on the internet, they want everyone to know about it, which I'm as guilty as anyone of. But at some point, I realized that I've kind of earned, I've found this part of the internet where I don't judge something because it's got less than a thousand views. I don't deem it as not scientific or as, you know what I mean? Which a lot of people will do. And I think what you're showing is you're just taking, you know, you're taking these concepts, you're going and applying them, testing them out in your own life. And then you've got, because you've got, you've got your sporting background where you've been able to compete at a high level mm -hmm. at various things. You can go, right, is this practice making me better? Yeah. And you've got that measuring stick. Yeah. And then the stuff that's working for you, you're yeah. you know taking along with you and the stuff that's not working, you're putting away. Yeah. And I think for you, the rope has been the, the main tool that you've come across, which has really helped you progress. Outside of nutrition and emotional work, in terms of physical tools in my training that I've implemented, that's been amazing. And that's not even to touch on the the sort of meditative benefits you get from it. it I, I wouldn't call it a meditate. You can call it a moving meditation, which people use and it, uh, would differentiate meditation and moving meditation are vastly different things. 
Because sitting and doing nothing is is a big difference from doing something, right? Yeah, but um, I would say it's a working in practice. Working in practice. It's an energy it. building practice. You like finish that. with the rope and you feel like you've got more energy than when you started with the rope. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. And so Weck talks about it balances your hemispheres because you're crossing your right hand over to your left and your left hand comes to you as you're doing the movements. And when you do this and you're doing right-handed work in the left part of your body is a very rare position to be in and you're learning to be dexterous on this side and you're taking your left hand over to your right it's also um so that he says that balances your hemispheres it's also a non-dominant side training tool because you can do a pattern on the right or you can do drag and roll one way and you try it the other way and you're not as proficient at it well now you can drill that move so drag and roll is sort of the third pattern that teaches us rotational timing and sequencing and so you can drill that on the other side and you can become as good rotating one way as you are the other way because you've, you've, it's, it's a tool for non-dominant side training. So say someone gets a rope, mm. where can they go to find the information to, go, to learn how to use that rope efficiently? Yeah. There's two main sources on the internet at the moment, which is WEC method and ROCAS move. Yeah. Um, but I've just put together a course. I'm about to record with the help of Lewis the final audio voiceover for that course so if you listen to this now it, it is online humantimothy.co.uk um if you you can buy the course on its own or you can buy a rope and you get the course for free whatever you want to do or you can go on the internet and just search WEC method rope and there's tutorials out there for completely free so whatever you want to do but i've just created a course i think it's it's the nicest one i've seen so far which is you know there's not much to compete with but i've got solfeggio harmonic I've got Source Vibrations who did the music for my last one. He's done the music for this, which is Solfeggio Harmonic. So that it's going to be doing subtle um, binaural work as well. And um, we shot nice locations with my friend Harvey, Victory Visuals. It's, 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 a, it's a well put together thing I'm quite proud of. So you talk people through how to do the underhand, how to do the overhand, how to do the drag and roll. And that, that's it for now. The three, there's four patterns, but there's the, that are like the basic patterns, but the three, the most important three for you to begin your journey is those three. The fourth one is the sneak, and that's kind of an evolution of the drag and roll. So I've left them for now with the beginner's courses, the underhand, overhand, and the drag and roll, because that's plenty for the first 30 days of training. Drill those, put the put the time in on those. And then, uh, you know, there's other, other tutorials online, but I'll work on an intermediate course after that. But I think to start, all you need is a rope and those three movements. And the dragon roll is a fun one, right? I've seen you improve at that lately. Yeah, definitely. A lot of fun. And I think once you get, the thing is, once you've got those three movements down, you can start teaching yourself, like you said, like you taught yourself. Mm. You can just start playing with it and making up your own movements and yeah. you start feeling the pattern. And that's the cool thing about the rope. It kind of teaches you itself. It does. It's, it's beautiful. And that, that's why I called it Golden Teacher. Because the, well, the rope's kind of like a nice golden tan color and it's, and it's your teacher and it's kind of a, an ode to the, the magical plant as well, which is <laughs> definitely um, inspired. I think the cool thing about yours as well, because you've got a few different ropes here. There's all the three brands that exist. Weck, mine and uh, Octomoves. What yeah, one's yours? The gold one, yeah. And the red one's Octomoves. Um, and there's a difference, right? Yours, is, there's a different weight and length. Mine's the same. Mine's very similar to Octo Moves. I am going to release a heavier one, which no one's done yet. A heavy one, and, I, and I've, I've got a heavy one sampled that I enjoy playing with. And I do notice the next day after I play with the heavy one, like yeah. a little more. Um, but for now, I've just released. I'm, it's a beginner slash intermediate rope, and the heavy one will be like an intermediate slash advanced rope. Um, but for now, I've just released the, the Golden Teacher as the um, nice gold. And I, I just, it's kind of like a hemp color. It's kind of a nat I like natural things, right? It's a natural color. Pretty cool. Cool. So I think that about covers all the, the main points for for this. If you want more, you can always hit me up with questions. Um, go to the website, humantimothy.co.uk. YouTube, you're all smart people. You know how to find stuff. If you really care, you can find it. Um, but for now, we, we asked anyone on Instagram to direct message our producer, Lewis, with some questions. So he's got some questions. And I said, there's no stupid questions when it comes to this stuff. People might not want to ask something. I said, there's no stupid questions. You've just got to ask it because it might help people who have the same question. Yep. Cool. So yeah, I've got one here from Isaac Shepherd 1410 And he asks, so I've been experimenting with the ropes, but I can't figure out how to incorporate the underhand swing into a flow. 
of the other variations. Any advice? That was the, I, was, I thought of something to say and then I forgot it. And that's just brought it right back. So one of the things, there's just, there's a guy who I'd say follow on Instagram. He's my biggest inspiration for this stuff is Savage Protocols. And he's like the main coach that taught me the rope from work method. And one of, I get these nuggets of advice from him. And he was like, because this was in my first three days of doing the rope. And I was like, how do I improve? How do I improve? Similarly to that. And he was like, just keep turning around. So as you do the rope, you do underhand and the rope swinging. So if you imagine you're standing there swinging a rope and there's sand at your feet. And as you're swinging the rope, the sand is blowing away from you in front. So you, now you know which way you're swinging the rope. Now, if you can turn your head to face you the way, but keep swinging the rope in that same direction, the, the sand should be going away from you and behind you. You turn your head, turn your hips as well. And so you're turning a 180 degrees with your body, but the rope doesn't change its rotation. It just changes its rotation in relation to you. So the ropes, it, think of it as a propeller that never changes the, the path that it's on. So the, the advice for that is just to practice turning around. And as you practice turning around, so you swing the rope on one side of your body, turn your hips into it, face the other way. Um, at, at the end of the, the beginner's guide, I explain this, and you can see it visually, which would help. Um, but yeah, basically it's just to keep turning around. That's the best advice I'd give. It's just to go from underhand to overhand by turning your hips and your head and just practice that turn. And quickly you get footwork and you get timing down that comes with that, that turn. Cool. Uh, so the next one is from Rosanna Rosley, and it is, what is the ideal thickness for the rope and why? It's a good question. It depends what you want out of it, of course. Um, so mine's 12 millimeters. I'd, I'd say that's ideal for, as I, as I said earlier, beginners and intermediate. Um, I've played with lighter ropes and they feel really fun and they can be I call the lighter one needle. If anyone watches Game of Thrones, it's a reference to Arya Stark's uh, sword. It was called Needle and it was a tiny little sword. And it feels quite fun. The thicker, if you want a proper workout, the thicker the rope, the more your core is going to get involved and the more muscles around your spine start to work. Um, so yeah, if you want a proper core workout, thicker rope. If you want an everyday one, about 12 millimeters and you could go for, I'd say 10 millimeters, but I won't go thinner than that. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't give you enough feedback any less than that. From the same person, have you got any small tips on corrective posture to receive the maximum benefit? It's a big question. Um, I, I guess I could save someone a lot of time and say <clears throat> work from the center of your body rather because posture, a lot of us go straight to feet and we get flat shoes and that can cause issues in the ankles and stuff like that. And you have to realize correct ankle positioning is a is a, a response to the hips functioning right so it's like we want to fix our ankles and our knees but it's like it can come from the the hips really so strength i think paul check's a good guy for this kind of stuff because he goes through um from crawling our patterns of crawling and stuff yeah he talks about uh primal pattern movements hmm. so if you type paul check primal pattern movements into youtube there's just a wealth of information there yeah, I think it's a good he, place to start. He's a great place for that. Cool. Okay, I've got this one from um, Kari Boosty. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it. but um, So if you were to go to an open field to work out with a rope um, and could bring two other pieces of equipment, <laughs> what would they be and why? I guess not. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, I think we're looking at them, right? We would take the kettlebells for sure, or one kettlebell. What weight would you take one kettlebell? 16. 16. I, I'd agree with that. I'm new to it, but yeah, I'd agree. Yeah. Um, one of the, I guess a sandbag. San, yeah? Sandbag, yeah. Sandbag, Hello, kettlebell, and a rope. That's You brought the sandbag, you brought the kettlebells, I brought the ropes. Trio, heavy Boom. trio. Yeah. <laughs> no fucking room. Let's do meetups on the park, on the downs. <laughs> yeah, cool. So what would you do... What do you think is the best way to transition into new forms of the rope play? Just try something that seems weird until it doesn't and becomes fluent, or how do you go about? <laughs> yeah, that's a great that's a great question. Yeah, try stuff that seems weird. Try to replicate things you you see. 
play with stuff with one hand, play with stuff with two hands. Um, yeah, dr drill, all, all things, are, those four fundamental patterns, everything from that is an offshoot. And I think working transitions is how you get the footwork. So if you work dragon rolls, then you work um, double dragons, which is where you jump 180 every time. So practice stepping 180 with the patterns, um, then you get the footwork. If you can get sneak, my favorite pattern to do is sneak into reverse sneak and then turn 180 and then do sneak into reverse sneak on the other side. And someone called it the sneak matrix, enter the sneak matrix. And it just looks so sick. Um, and that just comes from tra learn, practicing transitions. So do something on one side and see if you can get into it on the other side in one step, in one foot placement. And this will teach you the footwork. And then from then play with, um, it's all about variables. So put the hands high and swing high, put the hands low, swing low, practice really like going loosey goosey with the body and letting the rope really, so you can find some real weird fluidity. But in that you can sometimes find true patterns. I've done that before where I'm just doing um, matadors and I just let everything really be relaxed and just let the rope really lead me. And I just get such a nice spine flow out of that. Um, so yeah, it's just playing with different variables like that. Where does that terminology come from? Sneak, Matador, is that Weck? Yeah, it's his, it's his guys, I think, created. I think I think Weck probably came up with all of them. But I saw a video on his Instagram from like 2010 of him doing the rope. And I, I just don't know if there's any videos of anyone else up until 2017 that it kept, got any further than him. Like, yeah. But I feel like he, he thinks, and I think as well, like Egyptians or so, like, how hard is it to pick up a rope and discover what it does once you understand it from this perspective? Our ancestors must have done it and then it must have been forgotten or people started jumping the rope and that became like a cool exercise trick and they lost the original... Because you see boxers doing it. That's something I should have mentioned is like Sugar Ray Leonard. They hold it in one hand and they're bouncing and you can see them doing footwork shuffles and stuff like that. And they're getting the timing cue from the leather rope because the ro leather rope can go really fast. They're purely working on the fast footwork. And um, they're not doing the, the, all the same patterns, but they're, get, they're getting the timing of up and down on the feet um, using the, the sort of reload from the body. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, so this one's from Jake to the Bone. Mm. Um, he says he would be interested in making his own. Are the handles just quadruple fisherman knots? <laughs> and uh, how long does it need to be cut? Do like double his size in a bit? Yeah, uh, the hand, the knots should go up when the knots are tied. It should go up to about your nipples. Just, but I say just below your nipples is a good height. Once the knots are tied, um, you can do a quadruple. I guess I, I think it's a fisherman's knot. I've not actually know the name of it, but you just sort of wrap it around itself and took it down. Um, but it's you can do. I think Wex have five knots on them. Octo Moves has four or five. I've got I've got some with three then I actually quite like it with three so it might do that to keep it different but um, four four is a good handle so yeah I guess it, the fisherman's not um, on your point then you said where the move names come from yeah I think it's from them but they do they are what they say on the tin right I guess you got with the matador it's like you're swinging the way the matador moves the red cape out of the way of the ball and the sneak is your backhand is sneaking round so the rope sneaks over the top of your head. And is there anywhere someone can go, can you type in Matador rope into YouTube and there'll be a video of someone doing so it? So Matador there will be, Sneak there will be, but there's moves like Cheetah Tail, uh, Reverse Sneak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that I don't think there are, so that's, my plan is to do an intermediate course, which is just like 10 or 12 moves. And then my favorite um, like combos. So flow, there's certain moves that feel really good into other moves because it sets up the footwork sets you up to like smash something out of the park kind of thing. So I, my plan is to do an intermediate one that's really comprehensive, really well shot and just goes into all of these moves and then all the combos I like. And I reckon that, that could be done within one or two months. We'll see. Wicked. Cool. We're good? Great. Well, thank you guys. I really appreciate you guys letting me have the floor on uh, this episode. Um, I hope all the listeners got something, got a little more understanding out of it uh, with the rope. Um, next week I think we decided earlier yeah. due, by popular demand yeah. people liked the sound, the sound of uh, Chris's history and they want to hear some more 
Um, so if you'd do yes. us the honor. We will be delving into the history of secret societies, my yes. experience with Freemasonry, yes. conspiracy, and uh, yeah, bringing, bringing back the golden age into the modern day. Let's, uh, it's going to be interesting, guys. I'm looking forward to it. It's, it's one of my um, boyhood fucking like obsessions so i've got plenty of rabbit holes that we can go down and there's a lot of stuff that i've spent numerous hours talking to josh about which only scratches the surface so we've got plenty to do uh to talk about again the q a i like that little bit of an add-on to this yeah so, so where well, do we so, send the, send the questions on instagram to lewis bradshaw one. lewis bradshaw one all right sweet so if there's any questions you want to know about freemasonry secret societies throughout the ages. So you were the youngest ever UK or? Yeah, so what it was is... Just to give them a quick... Yeah, very briefly, by the time that I was 21, uh, the rank that I held within Freemasonry, I was the youngest in the world to hold that rank, to hold that degree. Wow. Okay, so any questions on that? Just on that, so a friend of mine who asked me about this earlier said is he going to be able to reveal everything that goes on in Freemasonry? And I said, I can guarantee he will tell you everything <laughs> unless yes, he gets suicided before this time I next will, week. Yeah, I'll, I'll t I'm, I'm very open to telling you everything that there is to know about it. I mean, to be honest with you, the, the sworn to secrecy thing was more so to do back in the day, whereas like if the Vatican found out that you were a Freemason, that you were like in possession of this sort of esoteric knowledge, you, you're fucked. You're burned at a stake or you're beheaded and, you're, and your bloodline's wiped out just to make sure that this knowledge wasn't passed down and sort of survived through the uh, dark ages. That's normally what the whole secrecy thing is about. In today's world, you can find everything that you need to know about Freemasonry on the internet. Honestly, you don't need to be... Oh, actually, we can, we can discuss this in more detail in the, we'll next, go into on it. the next episode. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm excited. For it. We could roll that now. <laughs> yeah, go straight into it. Um, but just to, to hit everyone with the points, yep, yeah, the, the course on the rope is out now. It's a big day for me launching this. humantimothy.co.uk if you are interested in more information. What about you, Josh? Where they see you? So three places for me, uh, ape underscore nutrition on Instagram, www.apenutrition.co.uk for the website where you can pick up uh, ketogenic protein bars, organic MCT oil, CBD oil, and a few coming new soon. things coming. Some things coming soon, yeah. Uh, and then YouTube, Ape Nutrition, that's where this podcast will be. You can see the video version where we're sat on a nice sofa on the black black and white checkered floor. Uh, yes, very Masonic, <laughs> this dude. <laughs> very Masonic, low-key low symbolism here. And for myself, guys, uh, you can find me at www.primalalchemy.co.uk. You'll find our range of supplements, uh, ancestral whole foods, clothing, uh, biohacking tools. Um, I guess you could call it enlightenment guide maps all on there. Uh, you've also got me at Primal Alchemy UK on Instagram. That's where my main sort of presence is. And then I'm also on YouTube under Primal Alchemy as well, where you'll be able to catch up with our podcasts which is not this one, it's actually my own personal podcast, The Red Pill Initiation Hour. So again, check, check that out. shit out, see what you think. Thanks for tuning in and yeah, ready for next week to go deep. Yes, thank you everyone. Thank you.